Well, our readings today are from Revelation and the book of John. Uh, there are not 44 chapters in the book of John, if you're curious. It's from the 11th chapter of the book of John, so for those of you who are going to follow along. Uh, our reading from Revelation today is the next to the last chapter. Uh, whenever I am doing a funeral, whenever I officiate a funeral, this is a scripture that is read every time I've done one. It, it is a vision of the coming of heaven. Well, I pick up in the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be His people. And God Himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who am seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And from the 11th chapter of the book of John, the raising of Lazarus, starting with the 32nd verse. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw Him, she knelt at His feet and said to Him, Lord, if You had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And He said, Where have You laid Him? And they said to Him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See, how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave. And a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and his feet bound with strips of cloth, and his faith wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of my mind and the words of my mouth be holy and pleasing unto You. Amen. One of, the, one of the things I've learned in life is sometimes it's very helpful if you start with where you want to end up as a beginning point. Uh, sometimes you've got to work the problem backwards. And it's important to start with where you want to end up. And so as you know where you want to end up, uh, you can do your planning and you can work out your day and the things you need to do, do so that you end up where you want to go. Are, are you following me on this? Because sometimes if you don't plan where you want to be, you can end up anywhere. Uh, I, right? Our famous baseball player used to say these kind of things. Yogi Berra, right? If you don't know where you're going, uh, anywhere will get you there. So, <clears throat> and... I find it hugely helpful to work a problem backwards. If I know where I want to be, then I can plan my day so, and do my activities so I end up there. Uh, there's a really 
good book on doing ministry called No Man Left Behind. And it talks about a very simple process because I'm a man. Simple works for me. Uh, God bless my little heart, right? You've got to do things linear for me to understand. So if you want to end up with a mature Christian, how do you go about doing that as the church? What processes do you need? What things need to happen in the church? Uh, and, and it starts with how do you uh, end up with somebody mature and then you have to have Bible studies. You have to have uh, these certain events where people are placed. Uh, you work from there to inviting people. And then you go out and you meet people in the streets. So there's this process of moving from one to the other in a continuum. Now, what's great about Revelation, this particular chapter, is it's talking about where we want to end up. And if you're a good Christian sitting in the pew today, I'm hoping your gold is the same as mine. Where do you want to end up in the end? In heaven, thank you. Good, y- y'all are on page with me. So the, where do we want to end up in the end? We want to end up in, in heaven, not to put too fine of a point on it. And as Scripture says, uh, this is the 21st, we, we get to the 22nd chapter of Revelation, and, and it says we finally end up in the very presence of God. Salvation is nothing less than being returned to the right relationship so we are in the presence of God. In the beginning in Genesis, we were in the cool of the morning in the garden and we were in God's presence. And all of Scripture is finally mirrored in the end in heaven. Where do we land? Again, in the very presence of God. The Scripture goes on to say we'll no longer have a temple. We'll no longer have a sun, a moon, and the stars because God Himself will be the light. And we will be in the very presence of God. The purpose of the temple was so that God could be in the presence of the people, but God couldn't actually be right in our presence. Uh, anybody know the answer to why God could not be exactly right in the middle of our presence? Why was there a need for separation? This, this is another word we use in church. Sin, thank you. I, I know we're a Methodist church, but we do use the word sin. You can laugh now. We actually use the word sin. Sin separates us from God, and this was the issue. So, of course, where are we going? Where do we want to finally end up? We want to finally end up finally in the presence of God. What was the brilliance of the incarnation of Jesus? Is God with us. God came across the divide that we ourselves could not, and so God came into our presence. Uh, The objective of all this is, where are we trying to all end up? We're trying to all end up in God's presence. Uh, All Saints Sunday, what are we doing? We're talking about our saints who have gone before us who end up in heaven. So the reading of John here, now, why the story of John, uh, the the story of Lazarus, having to do with All Saints Sunday? The question I always have whenever I read this passage is, is why did Jesus wait? Why did He wait till Lazarus had died? Why did he wait to go? Uh, We have it in the earlier chapter there. What does he do? He waits. uh, He gives it a few days. And then finally he shows up. Well, luckily Scripture uh, doesn't leave us hanging. Scripture tells us. So that we may see the power of God in Jesus Christ. So that we may see the power. Which leads me to the next obvious question is, why do we need to see the power of God? What is it that Mary... And Martha, what did the family need to see? Now, in the raising of Lazarus, y'all look old enough, and I'm going to go with this one as an assumption. Have y'all all all lost somebody in your life? We've all lost somebody, and we all mourn, and we all hurt. And the bringing back of somebody would, of course, be very comforting and very warming and very wonderful. So I know that's what Martha and Mary needed, but what is it that we needed that we're seeing in the Scripture? And... The answer is we need hope. We need hope that there is more than just what's here. Christianity is unapologetically a supernatural religion. That it is beyond the natural. We live in the natural everyday world and what we see and what we touch and what we taste and what we feel, that is the natural world and we see the natural order. But we need more than just what is in the natural order. We need something beyond all this. We need some hope in this. 
that there is more than being born, going to a Halloween party, and then being buried. Are are y'all with me? Do do y'all need more than that this morning? I'm assuming that y'all come to church every Sunday because you need more than what's in the natural world. We need something beyond this. We need hope. And it brings us to the point of this idea of sinners and saints. Now, with, with, within the Methodist church, we say the Apostle Creed every week. Y'all, y'all remember it? We said it earlier. You've said it so many times, you probably don't even remember what you said. Uh, right? That's the, the, the downside of rote memorization is. But some of the things we say in it are very positive. Sometimes when I'm driving in traffic, I have to hit myself on the, fo- on the forehead and go, I, re- I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Do y'all ever feel that way? I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I have to say it several times to myself. Do y'all ever feel that one? There are days when I'm like, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Especially when somebody sinned against me. I believe in it. Sometimes I'm not feeling it, but I believe in it. Well, there's also another line in there. We believe in the communion of saints. Uh, we believe in the Catholic Church, which is the church universal. That is, it's not just Methodists that are in the church. Uh, it is the body of the believer of everybody. Uh, some people think we mean the Roman Catholic Church. That's our friends down the street. That's a different church. But they're part of the Holy Catholic Church, Church Universal. But we believe in the communion of saints. And as the communion of saints, uh, what we mean by that is is that if you're a believer, you're a saint. So I'm going to ask the question that Amanda asked, how many here this morning are saints? Uh, uh, Okay, how many of you are sinners? How come more hands went up with sinners? You guys are more in touch with being a sinner than with being a saint. Look, if you're a believer in Christ, you're both a sinner and a saint. Okay, y'all follow me? So how many of you are saints? You need to own some of this. You need to own being a saint. As own as well being a sinner. Yeah, yeah, we're all too much in touch with the second one too well, aren't we? There is a battle that is going on every day, all the time, between a sinner and a saint that lives within me. Any of you have this battle? I'm not going to accuse you of having the same battle I have, but there is a battle between uh, uh, the right and the wrong, the doing the good and the doing the evil. This is the battle that takes place within all of us all the time. And it's not so hard when doing the right thing gives you good rewards in this world. The hard thing is to do the right thing when you're going to get you're going to get something bad for it. Anybody, you, you following me? It, it's, a, it's really easy when you get a reward for being good. But there is a battle between the sinner and the saint, and that is within us all day, all the long. And the reason that we need to know about the resurrection and the bringing back of the dead, the reason we need to know there is more is so that we have courage to live as saints. We need to have the courage to live as saints. That's the place we need to live in. As a, as a pastor, one of the things that we do is, is we try to find somebody that we think is another good pastor and we get into a covenant group with them. We ask them for their advice. We uh, ask them to be our mentor. One of my favorite ones, I, I was talking to him one day and we were just visiting and we were talking about different churches and his life conversation goes on. He brought up something very interesting. He said he had met a Methodist pastor who had a two-point charge. And for you who don't know what a two-point charge is, that means they preach at two different churches pretty much every Sunday. Uh, within the Methodist church, you can have up to a five-point charge, which means you get to preach at five different churches. Uh, it could be a not all on the same Sunday. So you can have multiple different charges, or you can just have one church like we have here. Uh, but this young man, he preached at two different churches, And he, at first, when he met my friend, he didn't think he was very smart. He thought he was kind of a country hayseed. Do you all know what a country hayseed is? You all are familiar with this, right? He was kind of a country hayseed, and he said, I didn't think he was all that bright, really. And he said, then he started talking to me, and he goes, I began to figure out he was a lot brighter than he looked. Or as we say in the country, he was dumb like a fox. You all know that one, right? If you don't know that one, come later, I'll explain it to you. 
So, he said, one of my churches, they love to be told that they're sinners. They love to be told how bad they are. And he said, and my other church loves to be told how good they are. He said, through the telling of my sermons and at the end of my sermons, from the things that I hear, I know that one of my church loves to be told they're bad and one of them loves to be told they're good. Now, the story of the Scripture that I read is, is we have both of these within us. The question is, which do we prefer to hear? And that says more about us than it does about the Gospel. This Gospel says that we are children of two parents. We're children of Adam and Eve, and we're children of God. And there are days when we have to choose which likeness are we going to take on. Adam and Eve, are we taking on the likeness of God? As we talk about All Saints Sunday, we have saints who've gone before us. We celebrate them this year. We celebrate them every year. We have saints that go before us. As you read in the bulletin today, for a long time, the early church used to just add another saint for each particular day. And so after a, a particular period of time, we had run through 365 days, so we had saints every day of the year, so you had to celebrate a different saint every... And then finally they got to the point of, well, we'll just put them all together as one. Didn't we do that with President's Day? So that's not like a new thing, is it, right? So they, they put everybody in, it became All Hallows Eve, right? All Saints Day, and where we get to Halloween, and as the church, we, it's our holiday. We celebrate the saints who have lived and died and gone before us. Now within the Greek Orthodox Church, they, they have a very interesting tradition of worship. Uh, the Greek Orthodox Church, they set their worship in the year 300, and they continue to do the same worship that they did in the year 300 that they do today. We're doing contemporary worship here compared to the Greek Orthodox, right? Our songs are from only 200 years ago, so we're, like, we're, we're in modern times. The Greek Orthodox, these are the jokes, folks. Thank you. For those of you who don't know, I, I have a cold this morning, so I've taken some cold medicine, so this is... Amanda will be serving communion later. <laughs> I'll bless the elements, and Amanda will hand the bread out. <laughs> but the Greek Orthodox Church, they believe when you come into worship, when you come into worship, you are being ushered into heaven. You are being ushered into the realm of heaven. And they have the Alpha and the Omega on each side of the church because worship takes place between the beginning and the end. The cross is in the middle because the resurrection takes place in the middle of time. They have a bunch of very interesting beliefs. And then usually in the middle of the sanctuary, they'll have a relic or they'll have part of a bone of a saint. So of one of the saints, they'll have part of a dead body in the church. Now, why in the world would you have part of a dead body in the middle of the church? And, and here's what they believe. They believe those who have died in Christ are more alive than we are. Did you get that? They, they believe that people who have died in Christ, who are in the presence of God, are now more alive than we are as we live here today. Did any of y'all ever feel like you're trying to figure out what's going on in life and you don't surely know what all is going on? I, I, that's kind of where I live a lot of days. It, you see, because if you're already at the end and you get to look back on everything, then you've got a lot clearer picture. The saints who have lived before us, they are able to see what they did in their lives. What it is important that we've lived through. Was, as I started this sermon, you've got to start with the ending in mind. Well, our ending is finally to end in heaven for us to be part of the saints that are one day read and one day our name will be read and God willing, a candle lit for us. God willing. And the question is, is when we're in heaven, what is it as saints that we can take with us? Well, I know we can't take our clothes. We're not going to take our cars. We're not going to take 
any stuff with us. The, the long and the short of what we can take with us, we can take other people with us. Do we so live our lives that our lives are a witness to the world so that they catch the hope that we have? My prayer for you, my prayer for this church, is may we be a kingdom people who usher people to the kingdom that they may be with God in eternity. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.